On today's episode of The Nikhil Hogan Show, we talk to Emmy Award winning composer and Juno Award winning jazz pianist Dee Dee Jackson on his career in music. We talk about how he developed from childhood his jazz piano mentors Jackie Bayard and Don Pullen, his critically acclaimed jazz piano solo album So Far, which won him a Juno Award, his award winning work on PBS's Peg Plus Cat, working with Questlove and The Roots, his work on the acclaimed film You and Me with Alexander Back, and much, much more. Stay tuned, you're listening to The Nikhil Hogan Show. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to The Nikhil Hogan Show. I am delighted to introduce my guest today. Dee Dee Jackson is an Emmy Award-winning composer, a Juno Award-winning jazz pianist, He is an accomplished arranger, composer, producer for television, film, and many other forms of media. He received his bachelor's in music from Indiana University in classical piano and his master's in jazz from the Manhattan School of Music. His mentors include legends in jazz such as Jackie Biard and Don Pullen. He has recorded, toured, and performed with some of the most acclaimed names in jazz, including Jack DeJanette, James Carter, and David Murray. He's a frequent collaborator with Questlove and The Roots, and he has won numerous awards and honors over the years. I'd like to highlight just two of them. In 2000, he won a Juno Award for Best Contemporary Jazz Album So Far, and in 2016, DD won an Emmy Award for Outstanding Music Direction and Composition with three others for PBS's Peg and Cat. DD, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you. Very happy to be here. I'd like to start right at the beginning because I always like to do that, how people developed. I think that's really a a burning question. Whenever we are confronted with a great musician, we want to know how it started. So for you, I know you started learning piano quite early. Can you describe your childhood in music? Sure. Um, I guess I demonstrated ability at a very early age. That was part of it. But also, you know, my mother used to sing to us and and, uh, get us interested in music. Uh, My kindergarten teacher, I guess, fortuitously, when I think about it now, uh, I had a, a, a piano that she would use uh, to illustrate whatever she was teaching and, and sing-alongs and so on in class very frequently. And so I very early on went back and, and begged my parents uh, to get me a piano. Uh, and uh, thankfully, they obliged uh, this beautiful Heinzmann upright uh, piano. I think it was a Canadian brand, actually. My father still has it up in Canada to this day. And uh, yeah, and I just started pounding away on it for uh, hours a day, which I guess was unusual if you're six years old. So I'd be playing, you know, three hours a day or something. Um, and things just continued uh, from there, basically. Do you have perfect pitch? Uh, I, it's funny. I mean, the answer is yes, um, but it feels weirdly qualified now. I'm noticing that as I get a little older, uh, and I'm not really even sure the mechanics of perfect pitch, but that the upper overtones perhaps have something to do with it. And if you lose the upper overtones, maybe that affects it. Um, so I'm, I'm finding that things are off by maybe a half step up or down on occasion if I'm being lazy about it. But when I was a, a kid, I, it, it was that classic thing where people could just play a giant cluster of notes and I could identify all of the notes and that kind of thing for sure. Did you have a teacher when you were starting out in that time that you were playing as a kid, a really young kid? Did you did your parents say, OK, we got to get him a teacher? They did. And, and I was weirdly, I think, um, uh, stubborn about who I would study with at that age. I, I, I have vague memories of them te- taking me to a couple of teachers, some of whom wanted me to do things very much by the book. And at the time, when I was six years old, I was really just doing everything by ear, which is how I liked it. I really didn't, I wasn't interested in learning the one note at a time approach that was typically taught uh, from the beginning. Um, and so I finally uh, was hooked up with this great teacher named Dean. Namer, who is still in Ottawa, my hometown in Canada, and teaching uh, brilliantly to this day with, with numerous students. Um, and, and she really allowed me for the first, I think, at least two years uh, to not learn any sheet music at all and to do everything by ear. Uh, I mean, I was learning advanced tunes that way, uh, advanced classical pieces that I had heard and tried to pick up. And it was really only when I got to a piece like uh, the Moonlight Sonata. When, I remember when I was eight years old, I wanted to learn uh, Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. And, and she was sort of saying, well, there are these things called notes. And here, you know, now you, you could probably learn it a little bit more clearly if you if you do this and so on. Uh, and that's when I started to finally fill in the theory a little bit more. But I, I was always very ear oriented for sure uh, from the beginning. Are you a good reader? So like once you were you're using your ear a lot and then once when you started to read, did you develop good reading? 
I think it took a while to be perfectly honest. It's hard to really make a direct comparison, but I, I generally feel like even though I did finally learn to read and 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 it was it was helpful to do so, I, I was still frankly much more ear oriented. I, I think a lot of my interpretations uh, came from listening to recordings. I, I remember, for example, with the Moonlight Sonata, there was a version by Van Cliburn that was very popular at the time, and uh, there was a certain way that he would phrase something where he'd have a little pause on this descending arpeggiated line, and I recall very often <laughs> emulating exactly the way he did it and that kind of thing. Um, so I, you know, I did all the theory. There was a, a program in Canada called the Association uh, or, or the Royal Conservatory of Music. And, and the, 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 the terminal degree you could get was the Associate of the Royal Conservatory of Music. Uh, I eventually did do that by the 12th grade of high school. Uh, it, it took me longer in terms of the theory precisely because I, I just sort of put it off and it was never really a, a priority. And I would say, though, by the time I certainly got to university, I ended up doing a, an undergraduate classical degree, as you mentioned, at Indiana University, I think. Um, uh, that's where I, I really kind of uh, realized the value of things like sight reading and and, uh, and and I thought became pretty good at it a, a, after a while for sure. Did you only have one teacher for that entire period? Uh, no, I, uh, you mean uh, uh, in college or up to college or? Leading up to college, yeah, before college. Uh, yeah, I mean, there was one strange year out of my life where my father, who was originally from Tennessee, got this teaching position in his hometown of Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, I mean, it's a whole long story, the story of my parents, which I always found so interesting that I even wrote uh, an opera that was that was partially inspired by their life story. You know, my mother was from China originally and the, the an ambassador's daughter and all of this business. Uh, my father grew up in the segregated South. So he got this job in Tennessee at a university that he couldn't even go to when he was a student because at the time uh, he was originally, of course, African-American coming along uh, during the segregated South. So we felt an obligation to move back for this, uh, what ended up being one year when I was 13 years old. So so for that one year, I had another teacher down there named Faye Adams, who was a perfectly uh, fine and supportive teacher. Uh, and then we decided it wasn't for us as far as Tennessee and, and moved back. But with the exception of that, I was with this one teacher for sure, Dean and Amer, all the way until uh, I got to college. When you were a kid, were you improvising and composing on your own? I started out very early on composing little pieces and things like that for sure, uh, and also improvising without even really realizing what it was I was doing. And frankly, it wasn't even until I got to university, and, and not even the beginning of my experience at university, but probably about halfway through. So I was really, by today's standards, quite the late bloomer, uh, unlike one of your previous guests, for example, like Matt Savage. Um, it, it really wasn't until then that I really discovered that I uh, was really more of an improviser at heart a uh, after all, and for that matter, that there was even this this field of uh, of music of expression where i could really realize those uh, abilities to their fullest and be a, a very personally self-expressive uh, as much as possible uh, namely of course jazz uh, so it really wasn't until about the second summer of university even though i'd listened to people growing up and uh, more informally oscar peterson especially chick korea people like that but it really wasn't until then that i really dived in and became extremely serious about it and then had a lot of catching up to do when you were listening to these albums by Oscar Peterson and and so forth as a kid, did you use your great ears to try and pick them up, uh, little things here and there? Definitely, yeah. I, I, I did the best I could um, doing things by ear. In fact, I, I thought Oscar Peterson especially, who I had the pleasure of meeting uh, on a couple of occasions when I when I became a professional artist, I actually became a Bosendorfer artist, and he also was a Bosendorfer artist. So there were Bosendorfer events that I met him at, and I heard him play a couple of times. And one of the very first live concerts I saw actually was was a Triple Summit concert featuring him and Claude Bowling and Michel Legrand wow. uh, at the national at the National Arts Center in Ottawa. So I was in the front row of that. But Oscar Peterson, you know, his approach was so blues oriented, of course. Um, he bluesified everything, even when it was something very technically challenging and more bebop fundamentally. Um, and that was a wonderful entryway uh, for me, because, of course, it's something that you can kind of play over everything as a jumping off point. Um, and uh, so it made it easier, I suppose, early on for me to kind of copy him and, and get that sort of uh, vocabulary in my fingers uh, before ultimately branching off to other people that influenced me. Describe your classical education, because one thing about my show is I'm very interested in kind of reforming classical education. I do like how jazz is so improvisational, and I often consider how all the great composers in history were great improvisers. And Absolutely. And how that art was lost in classical music education. And uh, now, since you're such an accomplished jazz musician, and you've also had that background in classical music, what are your perspectives on classical music, how it's being taught in the current age? And do you think it needs a bit of reform? Well, I don't know if I can talk. I've, I've been sort of out of the loop as far as what's currently being done. I can certainly speak to my own experiences. Uh, I, I, 
when I start talking about college, for example, to be perfectly honest, I had a pretty frustrating experience at university. Uh, it, it may not be um, due to the entirely to the teacher uh, himself, although I think that was part of it, uh, it being sort of a mismatch uh, in terms of his approach of teaching and my ability to respond to that. He had more of a negative reinforcement approach. Uh, but it might also have been just my waning interest in classical and the realization that it wasn't really uh, what I was meant to do. But I would say overall, there was a sense of rigidity in approach. Um, I had a lot of uh, debates at the time with this teaching assistant of this teacher who uh, insisted that classical music was just inherently a superior art form because the composers had worked everything out in advance and worked on it and sculpted it to perfection while jazz in his perspective was just something just being you know thrown out there it's such a ludicrous notion when you consider that they were all kind of like jazz musicians back in the day beethoven was a well-known improviser and bach was well known as as a virtuoso yeah, exactly. So I and, and this is essentially the counter argument one would make, not, not to mention the fact that jazz, uh, you know, uh, while having many overlapping similarities with classical music, is also a, to be taken on its own terms and is a completely different conceptual approach. So to make a kind of an A to A comparison to, seemed to me to kind of uh, not really be the point. Um, but my general approach, regardless of whether the teachers themselves were on board, <laughs> was to be more improvisational in my approach to interpretation, and, and even in my classical music, sometimes to a fault. I remember my, uh, for example, um, I think it was my senior recital for my undergraduate year. I had to play uh, the Stravinsky Sonata, um, oh. or was it the Bartok? Or maybe it was the Bartok Sonata. I'm not, I don't even remember anymore. That's really scary. <laughs> I think it was. It was some sort of Stravin. I think it was the Stravinsky was piano the, Sonata. Uh, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, okay, I see. I it see. had a lot of you know, crazy block chords and clusters, and it was very, very rhythmically uh, propulsive. Um, but I just completely forgot what I was playing at some point. And, and so I just completely improvised my way out of it. Uh, and, and you could say it led uh, to a further career of doing such kind of abstracted pseudo classical uh, at the moment improvisation. Right, right. Um, so, I, so I had a very loose approach. One of my favorite uh, improvisers, uh, or, or, yeah, that's an interesting um, uh, Freudian slip. One of my favorite uh, classical pianists, uh, who had a very improvisational approach um, uh, was uh, Vladimir Horowitz. Yes, and, and, yes. And so he was somebody I used. Uh, yeah, he was somebody I used as a model because he really, uh, probably, um, proudly uh, would would tell people that he never played something the same way twice. And you can hear different recordings, even of something as simple as a, a like his E major. I think it was a Scarlatti Sonata, and he would play it one time incredibly fast, one time incredibly slowly, and and it would just sound almost like a jazz improvisation. So so regardless again of of how it was actually trying to be taught to me. And I did end up leaving that teacher's studio and, and sort of struggling a little bit and, and finishing the degree, but but um, kind of having leaving a bit of a bad taste in my mouth. And uh, it was part of the reason that I was maybe inspired to go in a different direction, which ended up, of course, being a, being a good thing. Um, but despite of that upbringing, uh, my overall approach was definitely more improvisational, even as a classical musician. Horowitz is a great example. And in fact, all those old school guys like Chrysler and Heifetz. Heifetz was writing pop songs when, when he came over. Chrysler, they did their own cadenzas. Uh, Horowitz yes. did his own transcriptions. They were really yes. creative guys. And I don't know what happened nowadays. You can't change a note and everyone freaks out, which is it's just so crazy. But I, I think it's kind of cool that you felt that way because uh, in a way, it kind of led you to your next thing, which was the world of jazz. And what was that decision you made that made you want to go and do a master's in jazz at Manhattan? Yeah, yeah. So it definitely led to that. I mean, I finished the degree. Um, I actually, at the time, really had very little formal jazz training. I, I had uh, certainly been inspired by David Baker, who, of course, is this legendary educator, one of the first real jazz The bebop scale uh, guy, yeah. Uh, yeah, jazz with David Baker, as we used to say, <laughs> because he would, he would make people play exercises that would always end with that phrase, you know, jazz with David Baker, and then up a half step and so on. That's hilarious. Um, but uh, so, and he actually wrote wrote a letter of recommendation for me that was rather pivotal because uh, of my lack of formal jazz experience, other than basically taking his jazz improv course. So he wrote a letter when I was applying to Manhattan School of Music. Um, that said something like I was a, a part of a new generation. Uh, it was maybe overstated at the time, uh, but who was equally versed in jazz and classical music and da-da-da-da-da. Uh, and I was actually uh, accepted for my master's degree in classical first and, and was even given funding by the Canadian government for my classical studies because it was presumed that's what I was trained to do, that's what I was going to do. And I almost on a whim auditioned for jazz due to my limited background and thankfully was admitted uh, anyway and then had to reapply for my, my uh, funding from the Canadian government and thankfully they gave me the money for that as well. What tune did you audition on in jazz? You said you didn't have much training, but so what did you audition with? 
I literally went to the top floor, uh, you know, the, the music building um, at Indiana University where we would do jazz band rehearsals and so on. Um, and uh, I guess I said I was only doing the jazz improv class, but I was also playing, I think, in the AI jazz band. Um, and so there was some recording from the library that I record uh, that I uh, that I lifted <laughs> with my little Walkman professional of a solo I had done uh, that was in their archives at that point after a year. Uh, and I went to the top floor of, of the, the, the that building I mentioned and recorded I believe Miles Davis's all all blues and just did my own version of that uh, I think it was basically maybe just possibly just those two tunes or maybe one other tune uh, no formal trio recording other than uh, that solo with the with the with the big band uh, and that was basically it and, and thankfully they they saw something in me obviously and then they accepted me although actually it was initially in what they called a three-year master's program uh, which they described as a program for those who do not have the formal training to uh, finished the degree in the regular two years. I'd never heard of anyone else in this program, and to this day, I wonder if they almost even created it just so I could get in or That's something. Great. Because, yeah, I don't. I didn't know anybody else in it, and and as it turned out, I did actually end up finishing it in the regular two years anyway. So it became kind of moot. I'm very um, interested in your two uh, mentors, Jackie Biard and Don Pullen. I'm very familiar with Jackie Biard, obviously a jazz piano legend. I'm not so familiar yes. with Don Pullen. Let's start with Jackie, and then let's get to Don. Who did you start with learning jazz from? Yeah, so Jackie Bayard was my first teacher. He, um, uh, it was very fortuitous because I had already been accepted. I already knew I wanted to come and and study jazz, and I was assigned to a different teacher at the time. And I found out that he was there. I did a little research, and I thought, oh my god, I got to go to this guy. And thankfully, uh, <laughs> was was allowed to was allowed to join his studio. But he he was. Uh, I always describe him as a true walking history or walking encyclopedia almost of the piano. Uh, you know, and it's not overstating it because he he had studied himself uh, with people like Earl Hines, uh, but he but he also uh, was a colleague of of you know Sun Ra and and Cecil Taylor and, and all of these more forward freer jazz approaching people, uh, and was also very classically uh, inspired. In fact. One of the first things they had me do when I uh, first came to New York and was first studying with him, he was playing a gig at at the Birdland that used to be on the Upper West Side in Manhattan, and I was eager to sit in. And he insisted that I play this Scriabin etude that I had last been working on with my classical degree, you know, a few months earlier, as opposed to even improvising with jazz. And and that was very symbolic to me of his tremendous open mindedness. So he he really filled in the blanks in an incredible way. I mean, as your listeners may or may not know, I mean, he was also the, the pianist in Charles Mingus's bands, uh, famous uh, uh, jazz bands of the 60s, uh, just as my second teacher, Don Pullen, uh, was uh, the pianist in Charles Mingus's bands in the 70s. So so I got a really great um, lineage and broad-based experience from, from both of them. You mentioned uh, that he filled in the blanks, so to speak, and the spaces. Wow. Uh, so what, what would he make you do as an example week to week? Well, he actually had, uh, Jackie Bayard had a, a book of uh, 500 pages, which I, I need to find because at one point I actually, uh, he allowed me to take it and just make photocopies of every page. <laughs> uh, and it, it contained, you know, exercises and licks and phrases uh, from Art Tatum and just all pieces of his own and, and just different things. So was it was it his book? Like he wrote that? Uh, yeah, it was something. It was all stuff that he wrote in his own hand. It was very informal. It was all written out oh. by hand. It was nothing that was ever formally published or anything. Oh, that must be the greatest book. Yeah, it was amazing. I mean, it was it, it was uh, just full of little uh, nuggets of of knowledge of wisdom from that he had garnered directly from the source, essentially over the wow. years. So, 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 so that was part of it. Part of it was just. Uh, sometimes our lessons would just consist of of playing on a blues or some other piece. Uh, I remember he liked the tune Woody and You, for example, probably because of the slightly more difficult, uh, you know, half diminished so, uh, two two chords of you know altered dominant chord instead of just a regular major two five progression or whatever, and just an and we would just uh, play it and then go up a half step and play it again and just you know cover things and we would do a bit of a round robin where he would play on eight bars and your trade eights trade fours and so it was just a way of directly absorbing his entire vibe in a sense did he ask you to uh, memorize scales or modes or was he a mode guy i don't think he would be a mode guy right he's, he's pretty old school well not really old school that's what i mean like he it was sometimes um presumed to be the case but he really understood it all and uh, but no he, he was never really that formalized in his approach in terms of specific scale chords and things uh, he he kind of knew that you would learn it by osmosis it, it, it was never it was certainly wasn't taught the way it often has been taught these days where people people operate as if the whole thing has been figured out and this is how it is and and you sort of start by um i don't want to over be overly critical but you can sometimes feel like you're regrouping 
regurgitating, you know, licks yeah. and phrases and that being the main emphasis and, and not really getting to the uh, the more personal expression part because you're so fixated on 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 playing an existing pattern or phrase. So so I I, I, I struggle with that. I, I'm I, this is a bit of a segue and we can talk about this later, but I, I'm actually teaching a jazz improv course uh, at uh, Hunter College right now. And I've been struggling with not teaching it the way it, all of the books say that one should typically teach teach it and, and oh, those books to are terrible out. no i think those books are terrible <laughs> yeah it's hard to find like a good book that really covers it the way i would i, I feel like i was taught and the, the way i know i learned and and so so i, I basically having to kind of create the equivalent of uh, of a new textbook uh, and just kind of feeling my way as the semester unfolds to figure out a way to to address these exact uh, issues and and to avoid that that typical scale chord relationship and licks and phrases first kind of approach and take it from a more broader uh, freer perspective and then working our way back to the language uh, when it feels more organic to do so. Did he give you any cool anecdotes of uh, musicians that he worked with in the past? Sure. I mean, he he told me all sorts of things uh, over the time that I studied with him. I remember one of the things he told me was that Sun Ra wasn't actually uh, he, like I asked him, well, did, did Sun Ra really believe that he was from Saturn and all of that stuff? Because it would be very easy to think that he that he that he really was convinced of that in right. his own mind or something. Uh, and he was like, no, 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 it was all just kind of a. It was it, it was, it, it was a all stage thing. Kind of a, yeah, he made it seem like it, it was a very conscious stage thing. I I don't know if that's really true, but it was a fascinating um, thing for him to say. I heard Sun Ra was like rehearsing his band for like ten hours or something. It's a ridiculous kind of like he would just rehearse and rehearse and rehearse. Yeah, they had their own like uh, 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 place that they lived in in Philadelphia <laughs> yeah. for a while. It, was, it, it felt it felt almost cult like in a way that <laughs> they would just get up at any hour and rehearse. Uh, and I've since played with several people who also played with Sun Ra, like Ahmed Abdullah, the trumpet player, and Billy Bang. So they also have had their own stories about him. Okay, now I want to switch over to Don Pullen, a name that I think been criminally underlooked. I think because uh, he's quite a significant pianist. And did he? Uh, so when did he take over from Jackie? Well, the weird thing is that I ended up studying with both of them at the same time, and I, I did not, and, and I feel embarrassed about this to this day that I, I did not tell Jackie that I was studying with Don oh. at the same time because I didn't want to insult him. I mean, yeah. Jackie was my formal teacher at Manhattan School of Music. I was learning plenty from him, uh, but I basically I was visiting, an, uh, an, of course, now ex-girlfriend in Oakland, California, and uh, at, uh, at Yoshi's and, and seen a, a performance at Yoshi's and Don Poland was doing a master class there the, the the summer I think after my first year of my two year master's degree at Manhattan School of Music and I at that point had been going to the uh, and this really dates me I had been going to the the New York Public Library's uh, record collection records remember records <laughs> yeah and 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 this sort of is a reflection of what you just said about Don being less known than he deserves to be because he's one of the great pianists, I think, and com even composers in mm -hmm. jazz. But, I mean, his albums were not checked out. Everybody, every other album, it would seem, that I was trying to check out, like Duke Ellington, all the famous, you know, well-known artists, yeah. uh, Monk and, and uh, Miles Davis and so on, uh, typically were not only checked out but probably even stolen and never returned. <laughs> and Don Pullen's albums were just there. And so I just started uh, checking him out. And, and I think others had even said, oh, you, you sort of sound like him. You should check him out. And just became totally infatuated with his approach. So when he was doing this master class subsequently, I was the, the first to volunteer to play for him. I, I think I might have been the only person to volunteer. Like yeah. he, he was showing these these radical um, to me uh, and to, certainly to the audience uh, ways of, of improvising involving essentially dealing with the realm of inside versus, quote unquote, outside mm. playing and how you can create uh, this tension between the, even the two hands simultaneously uh, expressing yourself in this manner, or you could do it somehow um, by starting with, with essentially the equivalent of both hands inside and working your way out and then coming back in a bit and then working your way out even more and then coming back in again. And just all these structures involving uh, a systemization or his own at least personal systemization of the freer jazz uh, idiom combined with a, a funky bluesy element that he got from playing essentially kind of the organ uh, gut bucket circuit and and uh, which also taught him a tremendous sense of melody so it was a it was a potent mixture of elements that that was uh, incredibly appealing to me and and was very connected to uh, my own uh, interests uh, in terms of melody, in terms of rhythm, uh, and and weirdly enough, even the more freer stuff that he would do felt very connected to the sorts of freer improvisations I was already enjoying doing. That in my case were probably more informed from my uh, connection to contemporary classical music. So, uh, so it just felt like a very natural fit. And after I uh, essentially informally auditioned for him, it was essentially uh, that's what it felt like when I played for him at this master class. Uh, he immediately invited me when he found out I was living on the East Coast to come start. Uh, teaching uh, or rather studying with him 
And so I, I, I proceeded to do so for several years, uh, as I say, even as I continued <laughs> to study with Jackie Byard. It's it said he was influenced by, I guess, Eric Dolphy or Nat Coleman. But there was a mention that perhaps there was an unfair assertion of influence by Cecil Taylor, and that kind of dogged him throughout his career. Could you speak a little bit about that, the difference, perhaps, uh, of this sound? Yeah, I mean, I may be inventing this, uh, but I have a vague recollection of bringing that up with him and and. What you're suggesting, I think, was true that he 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 felt like people typically might compare him in that manner. But but I I never really saw that much of a connection other than the general uh, propensity towards being able to take things out, as you might call it. Um, uh, Cecil, of course, was was much more abstract, and and uh, I should say, rest in peace, of course, right? Yes, because yes. he passed very recently. Very recently. Um, yeah, so he was certainly broadly influential on anybody who was trying to play anything that was more freer in scope. Uh, but on a more specific level, I think his approach, uh, Cecil's approach, was almost more pointillistic, and the rhythm was often uh, kind of uh, change, uh, ever-changing in different interesting ways. And and Don really came out of uh, more of a blues and church-oriented background, so there was always a sense of, of, of groove that kind of was rooting a lot of what he did. Uh, he certainly played in contexts, especially solo in the case of Don Poland, where uh, he would play with the tempo, but it, it, I, I would say it was never as overtly, completely out there. There was always a melodic connection, and and I and even when he was playing with greater uh, freedom of of uh, of rhythm, uh, there was a, a, a connection to the blues idiom even even then to me. Uh, so th- I thought there was quite a bit of difference between the two of them, despite them both being often classified as more avant-garde or free jazz players. In your lessons with him, how did he teach the harmony of his system or playing out? What was his, did he use a particular methodology or was there a book that he referred to? Was there any classical harmony books that he, that he asked you to read? No, I mean, again, and this this gets back to my, my challenges teaching this jazz improv, of course, because I really am trying to extrapolate the kind of conceptual approach that he took. Uh, and it's it's not something that you see in a book typically. Uh, I would say that his approach was more just broadly thinking conceptually. Uh, I used to have a column actually for Downbeat magazine called Living Jazz uh, for about, uh, I think it was about five years every other month. And one of the columns I wrote was, I just titled it Thinking Conceptually for that reason, because I remember the lessons of Don Pullen. And, and what I meant by that was just the idea of you know, really trying to get to the heart and heart or the essence of what somebody was doing uh, on a conceptual approach sort of level and trying to extrapolate that and uh, incorporate that into what you were doing. And, you know, in, in terms of Don, that would mean, again, uh, dealing with this realm of, of inside where you're playing more within the implied tonality of a given context uh, versus outside where any number of elements uh, could be expanded in kind of an abstracted sort of way. Uh, and just exploring the tension between playing those two sorts of textures simultaneously, uh, transitioning from one to the other, creating a sense of relative tonality, as I often call it, or, or I, I guess I could call it relative harmony. I, I have, rel- yeah, relative tonality might be a better way of describing it. Um, in, in conventional tonality, of course, you have resolution chords, you have dominant chords resolving to one and that kind of thing. And and with this sort of dissonant approach, and especially when you consider it a spectrum from playing really inside and very tonally to playing really outside, you can also create a sense of tension and release by uh, having the, t- the amount of dissonance increase or decrease um, and, and having a sense of relative uh, kind of tonalities as a result set up in different ways as you solo. So, so that was essentially the nature of the kind of stuff that uh, that he would teach. But frankly, a lot of our lessons were also just as much about life. I mean, there were plenty of lessons where we I did not play a note and we would just sit there and we would just talk about um, the industry. We would talk about uh, how to set up performances and what it's like to perform. And, and he would advise me to, to get as much experience, for example, and find one place to play no matter where it might be every single week, which I subsequently did do uh, with his advice. And it helped me build up a, a, an initial uh, repertoire of many, many compositions uh, that, that populated my first couple of CDs when I finally you know, had a record deal and so on. Uh, so he gave me a lot of tremendous advice, not to mention the fact that he also directly introduced me to many of the people that to this day I am, I am still working with, uh, either people that I directly am working with or people that they subsequently introduced me to that I'm now working with. So, so he was uh, very, very uh, fundamental to my entire career, uh, not just my musical development. If we could get technical for just for one minute, let's say what's a very dawn thing to do musically on the piano? If you if that if that's a if that can be explained really. Yeah, yeah. Well, I could talk a little bit about the very first thing he ever had me do, which was when he was trying to demonstrate this inside outside conception at that masterclass 
in Oakland. And what he basically had me do uh, was play a blues, uh, you know, just a solo piano version of a blues and improvise on it in a more quote unquote conventional manner in terms of using the language that would be associated with the key you're in and the underlying blues scale associated with the key and all of that. And then slowly as each subsequent course of my solo progressed to kind of gradually, uh, again, uh, to use this sort of broad generalized term, take it out and deliberately get to a point where by the end you were you were consciously not trying to do anything that was uh, directly adhering to the underlying tonality of the piece. Uh, it did not mean that you should just abandon necessarily the underlying pulse of the piece or, or rhythm. And and so often this issue of inside versus outside, you know, there are still controls that, that you try to deal with. Uh, often for him, that anchoring point might very well be rhythm. So the rhythm might be continuing. Sometimes the left hand would continue inside, as I, as I mentioned, and the right hand would go outside. But for the purposes of this exercise, the basic instruction was uh, play blues, take it out over subsequent courses. So keep the underlying implied form, uh, but just in terms of your solos and what you were actually doing over that structure, uh, try to get further and further away. And and just that one exercise was incredibly eye opening in terms of feeling very much uh, like a source of liberation uh, creatively uh, and as a wonderful jumping off point to explore many other uh ways of, of doing things over the years from then from that point on. If you're in an F blues, what would your right hand do to go out? Like, would you have to consciously think of a, another keys scale? Do you think of another keys in your head? Or do you just uh, let your hands fall on certain notes and kind of gauge a tonality as your hands are moving uh, across certain notes? It's really, to me, uh, the way I think about it, it's more like thinking uh, deliberately not, uh, deliberately consciously not doing things that felt F bluesy uh, in terms of that tonality. Uh, so I think it's easier to think of what not to do in that, in, uh, you know, now that I really think about it, uh, than what to consciously do. Because what to consciously do can, as a jumping off point, as a starting point at least, especially when you're first dealing with this sort of approach, uh, can theoretically be anything else. Um, and I think it's almost better to, to think of it that way. Because once you start thinking, oh, let me do, let me play up a half step and, you know, that whole kind of approach, uh, then you're already limiting yourself to, to, in a sense, a lick and pattern mentality yet again. Uh, so it's really more about um, loosening uh, the cobwebs of the braid creatively and just trying many different things and starting, in a sense, from a, a place of almost chaos, which can be very scary for people. I think a lot of people aren't used to doing that. Uh, maybe scary is too strong a word, but you know what I mean. People are not used to just not having uh, anchors, anchor points. What would you tell a student if you wanted to start playing a little bit more free? What would you tell that student to think about? Well, this is, again, getting back to this jazz improv class, which is becoming a theme here. Uh, the challenge I'm having in that class is the students are at very uh, at varying levels. So there are some students that have tremendous knowledge, others that are relatively beginning. Um and so uh, when I'm teaching this sort of thing privately, the first thing I would do is see what the student did if I told them to do that and and get a sense of what they naturally are capable of doing, how they naturally think of things. Uh, and then I would guide them further from there because I, I really don't want to be overly dictatorial if it's unnecessary. If a student just, if you tell somebody who, even as somebody who's never really tried that consciously to just sit down and deliberately just play whatever comes to you or play over a blues, but in a manner that doesn't adhere to the underlying blues progression, uh, sometimes it's, it can be very surprising in a, in a good way, what they may actually come up with without any further guidance. Uh, and then it's a question of refining that, um, maybe adding slowly organic but organically more controls to the situation uh, and maybe more specifics and that's when you depending upon the student you can start talking about more specific ways to do it if you need to uh, you can start to talk about ways of developing things melodically um, in that context even if you're playing like a cluster or even if I'm bashing with uh, quote unquote which I hate to use that term since I always feel like I'm trying to be musical but if I'm playing something with my left elbow or something as I've been known to do uh, whatever the context still finding a way to link things melodically uh, and then you can also talk about um, um, ways of rounding your phrases out um, so that even if you're taking something out, there's a way to anchor your idea so that at the end of a given phrase that might correspond to the structure of a piece, for example, uh, where the melody might normally have kind of resolved for a moment at the end of an A section or something, you know, where you would then bring it back in a little bit into the blues once more uh, to define that structure. And that just doing that alone can give you a tremendous license uh, 
when you're uh, taking it out pro immediately prior to that to just go almost anywhere as long as you kind of bring it back in and anchor it uh, once more. So so there's a lot of different conceptual things. I, I do try to adjust to the individual. Uh, I, I have yet to figure out the perfect way to teach it more broadly, and I'm, I'm working on that as we speak. Now, moving along with your jazz career, I want to talk about your solo album, So Far, which won you a yeah. Juno Award in 2000. Let's talk a little bit about that album. The track listing has many homages to many great players. There's a Bud Powell track. Yeah. There's, there's all sorts of tracks there. Um, how did that album come about? And can you describe the composition process, the recording process? How long did it take actually to put that album together? Well, it's funny. There's sort of two answers. Uh, the album on a musical level was ready to go relatively quickly. And I, I generally, when I was actively recording more albums, I haven't done one in quite a while. I've been doing more television, as, as, as you've uh, mentioned. Uh, but I would I would be ready to do an album every maybe nine months to a year at the most. Uh, but that was the first album on a, a multi-album uh, initially it was intended to be I think a three album deal with with a major label so it was sort of my little mm. ma major label moment did the sun <laughs> but as a result there, it was a laborious process uh, there's even an article on my my ddjackson.com website about my major label journey uh, in my in the writing section if people are interested and it goes through the entire process of the frustrations of waiting around for essentially I think it might have been two and a half years or something to just finally negotiate the contract and sign the deal and um, um, so, so on that kind of bureaucratic level, it took a long time. On a, on a musical level, I was ready to go for a long time. In fact, by the time I signed the contract, uh, one of the conditions of me continuing was that I wanted to record two albums back to back just to make up for the lost time. So I ended up doing a second album that was quite different called Anthem with Jack DeJohnette on drums and Richard Bona on bass, James Carter and Minus Sinello on percussion. great people, yeah. Yeah, it was more of a, almost of a, dare I say, a fusion-oriented album in a certain way. Uh, Christian Howes, a great violin player I've worked with for, for many years. Uh, but yes, but as far as the solo album, conceptually, I did want it to be a tribute to people who had influenced me. At that point, I was more and more aware of, of the more specific influences uh, that I had been um, amassing uh, over the years. Uh, as a student, certainly, there had been periods uh, that I look back nostalgically on uh, now that I have a much more hectic life with a family. We're about to get a dog and so on. But when I was a student, you know, I, I would be able to just spend all night long and all day long absorbing any one artist and listening to every media I could get on them and studying it and internalizing it. And you just started to try to soak up, the again, the conceptual essence of these people uh, and try to find a way to kind of have it uh, imbue your own approach to things. If I say a track... Would you can you give me like a couple of words just to describe that track? Let's try with "Sweet uh, Sweet New York." Well, that one definitely uh, was not, not only resonated with me, but it became the basis for a subsequent entire album. Uh, so that piece actually appears as um, "Hopes and Dreams" on my "Sweet for New York" uh, uh, album. So that one was just my my. Um, reflections on being a Canadian in New York, um, uh, living in New York City and, and the source of inspiration it gave me. Uh, if I recall correctly, I, I wrote uh, some of that piece, uh, maybe the major elements of it when I was sitting in Fort Greene Park, overlooking lower Manhattan and uh, just being very inspired by being in, at the time in Brooklyn and in New York City uh, in general. And then, of course, after the events of 9-11, the whole perspective changed. And in fact, I remember also being in Fort Greene Park and looking at the World Trade Center burning uh, that day, uh, this clear blue sky. And then you would see these white clouds and, and I would follow them as I was walking to the park and then see them terminate at this, 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 the wreckage of this building. It was just a, a horrible day for everybody, of course. So that so that informed the subsequent albums, uh, Suite for New York, that I did that included that piece from so far, uh, and I expanded it into a suite that was both a tribute to New York as well as a, a, a kind of a reflection on the events of that day and, and all of the heroic efforts to to help and so on. Camiliano. Well, I had been listening to a lot of Michel Camilo. In fact. Um, uh, Daftus Prieto, the, the drummer who I subsequently went on to play with, uh, I know had played with him. Um, there was a tremendous uh, rhythmical uh, compulsion <laughs> to his approach, a propulsion, I guess, uh, and a wonderful melodic sensibility. So I was trying to capture those elements, and, and so it felt appropriate to, to name the tune after, uh, in honor of him. There's a Duke Ellington piece, Come Sunday. That actually is one of the few tunes I've ever recorded on my own albums as a leader that was a, that was not an original tune. I think that tune and uh, on the same album, um, Goodbye Pork Pie Hat by Charles Mingus and uh, I Mean You. Those those might be the three the only three tunes possibly um, that I have recorded that were not. Not originals, yeah, on, on any of my albums as a leader. Um, so it was a very meaningful tune, a tune that I actually wrote a paper on at college, tracing the history of the use of his tune 
uh, of that tune in various works, uh, including his sacred concerts and uh, I think his musical, I think was called My People and uh, and so on. So uh, I, it was just one of my favorite tunes and I wanted to, to include it. Maybe not. Maybe not. I, I recall it was a dedicated to Ornette Coleman, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I, I'm, I'm forgetting now. I, you, you might at this point know better than me. <laughs> but... Uh, but I believe that's what the idea was. And I, I think I just wanted to deal with some of the more, uh, again, broadly expressed harmonic concepts that, that Orna Coleman was known for and uh, do it in this very quick little, almost miniature sort of uh, improvisation. I mean, of course, all of these pieces were improvisational in many, in many ways. I'm a huge Bud Powell fan. Can you talk about Poco Locomoco? Yeah, that was just one where I, I thought it would be fun to, to do something that I hadn't done a lot of directly, which was to play uh, right ahead, the bebop head. Um, that was more kind of inside that language, but then try to uh, do my own take on it in a sense that could maybe abstract the concept a little bit more. Um, so I think that was the the point there. So obviously the title was a play on one of his own tune uh, titles. Now the goodbye pork pie hat. Uh, now you've got two uh, t- mentors who who used to work with Mingus. So t- tell me about this piece that you, you recorded for the album. Again, just one of my favorite tunes by by Charles uh, Mingus, an incredible uh, altered blues. To this day, I couldn't even remember. I couldn't tell you without having to look at the music how many bars it has. If it's a twelve bar altered blues or if it's six, I just don't even remember. There's but and yet there, so there's something very unpredictable about the way it unfolds harmonically. And yet it also has the quality of being uh, paradoxically inevitable at the very same time, which to me is often the hallmark of a beautifully constructed piece and a wonderful, in this case, vehicle for for improvisation. Um, So it's just a piece I just wanted to include because I love it so much. You mentioned the word harmony and, uh, you know, you're a very accomplished arranger, composer and producer for film and television. How has your knowledge of harmony developed? And you have a background in jazz. How has it developed over the years? Because film scoring is quite quite a little bit different, but jazz does influence film scoring over the past couple of decades. When you got into film scoring, how did you uh, develop, so to speak, musically? Or did you adapt or did you find that you were ready to go to that you didn't need to augment much when you were jumping over to composition for, for a different kind of medium. Yeah, I mean, I would say that it wasn't so much about any uh, formal harmonic training uh, on a, in, in terms of a specific course or something, although I certainly had plenty of such courses in my training. Uh, it was really that I'd been programmed, I, I would say, as a jazz musician to just be, again, conceptually open-minded and, and able to react very quickly to new sources of inspiration. I mean, it was something that I was uh, doing in a specific way surrounding my jazz development, as I had mentioned, just studying Keith Jarrett all night and that kind of thing. But when I was called upon to write music, not only for for film, but even more so for children's television, even to get more specific, uh, it, it seems surprising to people, but uh, uh, there are shows like The Wonder Pets, which is one of the shows I wrote for that are notorious for having a full orchestra, uh, for writing in a variety of styles, for using real instruments. And so you'd be called upon to write. Sometimes uh, there was one episode I wrote that was set in Mount Everest. And so I had to study the music of, of Nawari uh, folk songs. Uh, and, you, and you would have like four days and you'd have to get the essence of it as best as you could, of course. I mean, you want to be respectful of the source. You didn't want to just do some terrible bastardized version. So you really wanted to try to dig in grasp the conceptual essence and then put in your own hopeful two cents that that made it worthwhile for you to be asked to do it in the first place and then to create an entire score from that and so on and there'd be other episodes like film noir and uh just a, a, almost every conceivable style so it was really more as a jazz musician just i think being trained to be open-minded and be able uh, to be able to extrapolate conceptual ideas and work very very fast to deadline uh, that was the 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 thing that I, that I was called upon to do uh, in that world. How did you develop your knowledge of orchestration? Because that would be very important, right, when it comes to putting together pieces for that require a, a wide palette of sound. That's an excellent question. Um, I struggled with it at first, in part because uh, it was sort of like when I was trying to write opera for the first time, uh, or even songs, where I really realized that I had been so focused on the music end of the spectrum that I needed to even join the BMI musical theater workshop, which I ended up doing just to really understand the connection between words and music. In in the case of orchestration, I think I'd been thinking a lot as a a pianist. So I had been playing many orchestral colors on the piano, uh, but because the the piano, of course, is such a complete instrument where you can really do that, uh, I I wasn't really parsing out how that connected to how I would use instrumentation uh, instead. So I found that uh, my earliest useful entryway, uh, when I think about it, 
uh, made sense, which was writing for strings. So some of my earliest things I was asked to do for real instruments was writing for strings. And strings are very homogeneous, just like the piano. Um, and not that you would want to just d uh, d uh, directly take everything you'd play on the piano and just put it onto the strings. Of course, there's you, you want to get inside the instruments too. But in terms of the texture, uh, it was an easy entryway. And frankly, technology, I, I personally found, and, and others may have done it different ways, uh, in more conventional ways, studying from specific books and, and so on. But technology was a huge assist for me. So the point that I started writing for media was also the point, uh, the first point where you could really put an entire orchestra essentially into a single computer or, or into a single box, as they might more broadly put it. Uh, Didi, are you referring to like high quality samples in, in uh, sequencers? Uh, yes. So Basically, the point that I entered the picture uh, uh, in terms of writing for media was when Logic Pro uh, became more, well, it was, it was actually still somewhat expensive compared to today, but it was more affordable. Uh, I didn't need any hardware outboard gear, and I was able to just slowly build up a, 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 what I consider a more sophisticated sample-based library. Started with the simplest tools, like Garrett and Personal Orchestra was probably my very first purchase, and I think it's still out there and it's still a perfectly fine starting point, I'm sure. Um, but then uh, gradually expanding, uh, and then as I started to get work, uh, using the money that I would make from whatever job I was doing to as an excuse to, to buy something else and uh, get to the point where I really had what I considered the best versions, for me at least, of every possible, at least acoustic-based instrument. And I'm still filling out uh, other sorts of sounds, but, but certainly on that level, uh, getting to the point where you could really not only uh, um, have access to all these sounds, but even really produce finished product that way. So obviously, having that at your disposal, it gave you almost godlike powers, dare I say, to mix and match and try out combinations. The key, of course, was making sure that the sounds, that, that you had some knowledge of the source. So you couldn't just do it blindly. You have to, of course, be listening to orchestral recordings and studying things, maybe even studying scores, of course, and things like that. What do you study? Uh, I'm but, cu curious. Give some specific examples of what you've studied to improve your orchestration. Uh, well, it really depended. I remember looking at Stravinsky a lot. Uh, I would buy orchestration books. I'm forgetting which ones now, of course. It's been so long. Uh, similarly, in the jazz world, I would I would, I would, would do things like Inside the Score was a jazz uh, big band thing where you'd kind of dive in. Um, so uh, often it would depend upon uh, the time available and uh, whatever a project was that was coming up. So if it was something uh, based upon uh, a certain kind of style, then I, then I might start studying the scores uh, in that style and so on. Uh, so, it, so it really did depend. Uh, but I would say that uh, even as I did do that, a lot of it still was more ear-based, as it really has been my entire life. So really getting the sense of something, even from just listening to it, and then trying to uh, extrapolate that using my virtual instruments um, to uh, experiment and mix and match and, and really start to... Uh, derive some uh, some rules. I also took some formal uh, courses. Um, uh, I think his name is Scott Smalley, if I'm not mistaken. He has this orchestration course I don't know if you're aware of. Uh, he's an orchestrator that uh, helped such composers as uh, I think Danny Elfman and maybe Hans Zimmer as well, but I, I'm, sure he, I'm sure he worked with Danny Elfman a lot. So he, he has this course that he'll do. He'll go to major centers like New York and you'll pay him for, you know, to do this intensive over the weekend. And he'll give you just a ridiculous number of, of movie scores from, you know, Batman, Danny Elfman's Batman and various other things. And, and he'll go into great detail about uh, his approach to orchestration. Uh, and so that was also extremely valuable to just kind of, uh, again, fill in, fill in the blanks. So a combination of a lot of different things. Something people don't realize when they're watching TV or they're looking at a TV show is the production is incredible just for one episode, right? Could you talk a little bit about, as an example, how much does it take to produce the music for one episode of Peg Plus Cat? Well, it's funny. I mean, I know for a fact, I was told one time that a single episode, not just the music, but the entire episode of The Wonder Pets would take seven months. My goodness. And how long is one episode just to watch on TV? It's probably 12 minutes. So a single <laughs> wow. a single 12 minute episode would be would be seven months. Of course, you know, you're not only working on that one. It, it, there's a whole kind of conveyor belt almost process where you're working on uh, or, or the, the company as a whole is working on different stages at any one time and various scripts at different stages different stages of the music and your actual uh, work as a composer though would would really be more of uh, a reasonable maybe two and a half to three week process per episode uh, you would uh, for peg plus cat typically we'd be assigned an episode we would be given up to about 10 days to do the first pass but usually I would give myself four or five days realistically of 
you know, long hour days of 12 hours or whatever. I just like to, to work, get into a zone and work in a row. Uh, you would present them the, with the first pass. We would have a uh, uh, kind of a Google Hangout meeting, which was nice. We didn't have to go to the studio physically as I did with the Wonder Pets. And uh, they would give us any notes. And then we'd have an opportunity to maybe to do one other pass, one and a half other passes. Um, but the weird thing about that episode is that as the composer, you're not only required to write the actual music, you, your job is, is very weirdly multifaceted. It's a very unique job. You, you basically have to, first of all, uh, act out the entire episode, all of the acting, all of the dialogue, not just the songs, uh, to be used ultimately uh, as the timing reference for the animator. So the animation uh, actually comes afterwards, which which is very much the opposite of how it's done with the film. Wow. So you, you guys have to kind of say the words just to get the cues, right? Yeah, and, and and I've been in situations where you hear the final version and, and you're like, oh, they act, they kind of used a bit of the way I acted that scene, uh, and, and and certainly the way I, I sung the scene as well. But you need to do that because then you then you have to go through and do all of the underscore, so the accompanimental music. You have to do any songs as they appear, and usually there's two to four songs per episode. Uh, they'll provide you the lyrics as part of the script, which is very handy. It saves time, so you're not writing the words, but uh, you basically have to base it upon the words and maybe do a few little minor tweaks. You even add um, at least temporary sound effects. You provide a lot of the, uh, or, or a reasonable amount of the potential instrument uh, instrumentation. Uh, although in the case of Pig Plus Cat, which I always thought was fantastic, they would replace at least four instruments with real instruments. So they would use real drums, bass, guitar, multi woodwinds. Uh, they would keep my piano and any little orchestral stuff uh, that I might have added, depending upon the style for that particular episode. Uh, and then you even had to do the score uh, at the end and the parts uh, in Sibelius and so on, exporting them from your from your logic session. So it was a very multifaceted job for sure. So you're using Sibelius. Let's talk a little bit about your equipment. So for an episode of uh, Peg Plus Cat, what kind of stuff would you use? You use Sibelius for the score. Uh, what about your DAW? Uh, definitely logic. I'm definitely been a logic person for many years now, and I found that many uh, of my uh, my peers also have used logic. It, it seems to be very popular among composers. Although I was doing a um, a seminar at uh, the uh, Firestein uh, Graduate School of Cinema at Brooklyn College, where I've recently started uh, teaching uh, adjuncting. Uh, and I was surprised when I talked to the students that not more people were using Logic. I, I guess uh, my my notion that everybody uses it is is not entirely true. Um, but yeah, so I use Logic. Uh, I have a, a template that has a bunch of different sounds that I typically find appropriate for the show. Um, it's a fairly large template of I think at least 31 gigabytes worth of just stuff that take that takes you know 10 minutes to load. What are your go-to sample libraries that you like to use? I would say the first one for acoustic instruments, as far as uh, any orchestral instrument, especially any kind of solo-oriented instrument, would be uh, sample modeling. Uh, I don't know if there is as known. Uh, and in fact, I think they just, it's confusing because there's this technology called SWAM, S-W-A-M, which I'm forgetting what that stands for. Uh, and they recently worked out a, an agreement with a company called Audio Modeling. So I think now the, all of the libraries I have are split between those two companies. But basically, it's a physically modeled form of, of sampling. I mean, it's a combination of physically modeled and samples. So they don't take up a huge amount of space, but they sound incredibly expressive. And especially if you're a pianist and can use a expression pedal and a modulation wheel uh, to add at the moment additional expression, they handle all the articulations automatically. And, and you can just basically play uh, at least initially into the computer and then do some potentially minor tweaks um, later. So I use that for, for all of those sorts of instruments that are acoustic horns and trumpets and uh, they have libraries that come with three or four French horns, so you can uh, have different instantiations of, of, of different slightly varied versions of the sound to create entire sections. Uh, and then I use things like LA Scoring Strings, which I think is one of the great sample libraries for strings. Uh, Trillion for, for bass, uh, Superior Drummer for, for drums. Um, and the, you know, the list goes on, but those are, those are some of the, the basic, uh, libraries that I, that I use a lot of the wave plugins and so on for, for effects and things. What do you think of uh, Dorico, the new, uh, notation software, uh, that's, that's come up pretty recently? I love it. And, and I've already bought it and I'm eager to switch. Uh, I've, I've been pretty vocal, uh, on the boards along with others about the fact that it, it's missing certain key things. What's missing? What's missing that needs to come in? Well, some of them are very basic, like slash notation, which I know is is coming. There's a, a couple of workarounds that are not ideal. Like if you if you cr change the note head to slashes and then you transpose, it screws it up. And uh, one big one for me, and I've been um, 
not not that uh, our concerns are dismissed, but there there is definitely a dividing line on the forums, the Doracle forum, between those that are pure notation people, and and I've certainly been from that world. I've I've been a professional, you know. No, it was one of the first things I did make to make money, having a little business where I would do professional notation. So I've, I've definitely been there. But between those people and those and, and the people who are coming more out of the, the DAW world, uh, so generally anytime anybody says that they would like something as simple as a click, for example, which is something <laughs> I brought up not too long ago. Yeah. Uh, others are like, well, I don't see why you need a click and you don't need to click for any. Re-. And, you know, it's, it's just a if click would be nice. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's just a, a nice, useful point of reference. Yeah. Uh, it, it just seems really obvious to me. And, and I know they intend People to add it. People are fighting over a click. Can you believe that? I thought it would be just standard. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I mean, there's, there's always at least one person who will say, well, you don't really need that. And, and it's like, well, no, there are some people that, that work in, in uh, both worlds and um, would love. That's for, the, for, that's for the playback, right? The playback engine. Yeah, so when you, whenever you're playing back something, you just have a, a metronome that you can use as a point of reference. Uh, I mean, I know they're adding that. They already, of course, have the play window with MIDI controller potential editing that will become available that's not there. That's the other thing that I'm waiting for. Real-time uh, MIDI entry, is, is a, it's not an oversight. It's just not been a priority yet, and I know, again, they're working on that. Uh, but once they add that, uh, and now that they have added chord symbols in, in a tremendously impressive, robust way, uh, once that happens, then I'll definitely be switching. In fact, I've sort of locked in at Sibelius 7.5 uh, al- almost in um, uh, as, as a, as out of respect for the, the creators of Dorico who are basically were working on Sibelius until 7.5, until unceremoniously dismissed, and they outsourced the further development of Sibelius to the Ukraine and so on. So it's still a wonderful program, but I, I, I feel like I have what I need for the time being uh, up to 7.5, and and when Dorico adds those few features, hopefully over the next year or six months to a year, then I'll plan to fully switch over. I want to talk about to end off. I want to talk about your the film You and Me, where you composed, performed the score, you wrote and arranged some the songs with the director. And it won yes. the Audience Award for Best Comedy at Film and VR Festival, right? Uh, or Cinequest, yeah, Cinequest, Cinequest yes, Film right. and VR. Yeah, in, in San Jose. It's, it's, it, it was a Silicon Valley-based film festival, which was very interesting. So, yeah, t- talk about that. So that's winning some rave reviews. Could you talk about how you worked with the director and the score you came up with for that, for that movie? Yeah, I mean, Alex uh, Alexander Bach is the director. His wife, Hilary Bach, a brilliant actress, and uh, Paul Guyette are the the leads in the film. A wonderful uh, a blind actual actor. Uh, the the film itself is tells the uh, it's sort of a romantic comedy and tells the story between a blind uh, man who falls in love, uh, who happens, I guess you could say, to fall in love with a with a deaf woman played by Alex's wife. But my relationship with Alex has gone back for several years now. He was actually one of the first people to ask me to write anything for media years ago. Uh, We did this uh, essentially ultimately unreleased film called Untitled A Love Story that was also very much a piano based track. Uh, We also did a film called Hollywood Musical, uh, which I think is still available on Amazon Prime and uh, has a lot of good things in it. It actually predated uh, La La Land. (laughs) Uh, So we we were surprised to see the similarities, to be honest, um, in terms of uh, Different. I mean, we have a piece in ours called La La Land. No kidding. Uh, for, no kidding. Uh, the, yeah, the first the first piece of 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 our Hollywood musical movie is called Just Another Day in L.A. And the first piece of La La Land, is Another Day in the Sun. You know, just uh, and there's an audition scene. It's just it's kind of interesting because it did come out before. But anyway, so that w- it was on Amazon Prime, but it was never really uh, fully commercially released. So yes, this is the first one that we've had some uh, real response to. Um, and the, my approach to the score, it really came initially, at least out of more of an improvisational approach. Uh, the very first cue, I, I recently actually put it up on my website under my video section or whatever for Holly, uh, for uh, you and me. Um, but it was basically uh, the sort of mirror scene where, where, uh, Hillary's character is in front of a mirror and looking at uh, herself and putting on her makeup and thinking about this blind guy and their relationship and where it was up to that point. And it was, it basically just came out of a piano improvisation. So I just watched the imagery and just sort of improvised and, and really th- almost thought I would take that approach, uh, entirely <laughs> to the score. But, you know, as it evolved, there were more structural things that I added. And I eventually hired, uh, Christian Howes, this incredible string player, uh, to overdub multiple string parts and create a string quartet texture as he's actually done on several of my CDs now as well. Uh, I hired a former student, a very talented flute player, uh, you know, named uh, Gabrielle Garrow, 
uh, to play the flute, and uh, and it expanded uh, from there. And the songs that appear in uh, the film that I that I wrote uh, with the lyrics by the director again, Alexander Bach, uh, those came out of Logic, so they were they were essentially uh, virtual instruments. Uh, there's one scene where the character in the film. Uh, his name is Jarrett, and it was named after my son, actually, because at first Alex was insisting that I try to play that role. And I was like, no, I'm, I'm not going to. I think he, he thought he could bribe me by by naming the character after my son. Uh, but there's there's one scene where he's playing an acoustic guitar and it's entirely just a real guitar virtual plug in. Um, but it, it, I'm not saying that it sounds completely authentic, but certainly the fact that you see him playing it, there's something that fools the mind. And, and you know, we kind of got away with it. Well, you've got the movie and you're creating music to the scenes. Do you go by mood? Is that something that you do you try and follow the mood of the scene? And and uh, musically speaking, let's say there's a very like uh, a touching scene on the screen. Yeah. Let's go musically into it. Let's Just as an example, um, do you think yeah. a slow major key and do you think maybe you, you go to a different mode or do you do you go through diatonically the, the chords or the, what's your thought process? Yeah, well, I have to say, again, I tend to think more conceptually about things. And it was actually particularly useful, therefore, in this case, that the director, which isn't certainly always the case and perhaps is even often not the case. Uh, but but Alex is extremely musical and very perceptive of what he likes and what he doesn't like. And so while a lot of people don't like things like temp music, uh, I actually sometimes need some limitations imposed. And so he actually would give me uh, some pieces that I certainly ended up not copying and not doing some just sort of hackneyed version of, but but were a wonderful jumping off point in terms of the sort of texture and emotion he was looking for. So after working with him for several years, you start to hopefully speak a certain similar language. You kind of understand what he means when he gives you a certain piece as a reference, what element of it he might be looking for. And and of course, you could also discuss it further to, to clarify. And so that's essentially how I would approach it. If he gave me a specific scene, he'd say, okay, well, this is this is this other piece that is the sort of essence of what I want. And uh, and then I would take my cues from that and, and imbue it, hopefully, with my own personal touch as well to make it original. Mentioning temp music, what's your opinion on temp music? Is it a very general, broad question? So does do you feel like it can be overwhelming to your sensibilities? It just clouds your mind with, with a preconceived idea? Or do you feel it's helpful? What do you feel about temp music? It really depends on how the uh, the person who gave you the temp music often the director or the music editor, uh, what their relationship is to that music. Sometimes they they develop, of course, the the classic uh, temp uh, envy, I think it might be called or something. Yeah, I forget what the term is. Is that what it's called, temp envy? I forget. I'm not sure, but I but, know what you're saying. It's like the, yeah, where everybody loves love the temp too much, yeah. Yeah, and then they want, and sometimes they'll even use it. I mean, you've seen films like 2001 where they just use the music that the, that they intended <laughs> yeah. to use. I just, I just read the color purple was like that, and I, I had to look this up. I'm not, not even sure where I read this, but I think it was just yesterday, uh, because I would have assumed it was just John Williams, but s- somebody had said that that was the same thing that Steven Spielberg had used some sort of temp music, and he really liked it, so it just ended up being used <laughs> for at least part of part of that film. So it could be overdone, but for me, you know, especially working often in television where deadlines are very, very quick, uh, I find that an incredibly useful aid, um, uh, especially if you can use it as a point of discussion uh, to try to clarify with the person who gave you the temp music to what extent you want it to sound like this aspect of it or that aspect. What, it, what is it about this that you like and, and what should I ignore? Uh, it's a great uh, point of discussion because often you're looking for more limitations rather than, than less, uh, even though that might seem uh, surprising to some people. Are you always learning? Are you always trying to learn new things? Yeah, absolutely. Musically, what are you trying to? What are you trying to learn? Well, I, you know, I don't know if this has been. I, I've discussed this recently with people whether my normal tendency to just be very open-minded and, again, I keep using this word conceptual, but just sort of conceptually open-minded about different approaches to music in general and just art in general, uh, whether that is a hindrance versus the type of person who, you know, knows what they want and they go to Hollywood and they want to be known as the number one ambient music person and they get all the gigs as a result. I mean, I I was sort of that way with my jazz career initially, um, you know, very motivated to kind of have some success there and feeling ultimately confident about trying to get out there. Uh, But I, my approach to media has been quite different. Um, So I generally try to just be, to cast a wide net. And certainly when I have an assignment of some sort or something that I'm 
that uh, called upon to do in some way to use that as an excuse to just completely dive into a certain style of music. There, there's a project now, which I don't think I should mention the specifics yet, but just to say that it's rooted in um, kind of 70s soul meets hip hop. And, and I realized in doing some preparation for it musically uh, that my perspective on that music was really through my relationship to all the jazz musicians who had been influenced by those styles of music rather than having the direct knowledge that I really wanted to have. So I, I spent several days when I had a week off from my adjunct teaching duties to just completely go to a library and just listen to hours of stuff and research and watch documentaries and you know, just fill in the blanks. So when I hopefully get this call shortly that I am anticipating to start to really get my hands dirty and really write the music, I, I will have done the prep work uh, necessary. So I love doing that because all, all I can do is make you a better artist overall. Name me three uh, of your favorite jazz musicians and three of your favorite classical composers. Okay. Uh, well, let's see. Well, jazz musicians, definitely Polonius Monk, um, I would say, and Keith Jarrett. Those are two big ones. Don Poland, certainly. Uh, come to mind. I'm, I, I love uh, Pat Metheny as well uh, for different reasons. I just like anybody who's conceptually broad-based and open-minded and has done a lot of stuff. I, I'm actually quite a fan of Brad Meldow lately. I was just listening, speaking of classical music, to this new album that he did where he extrapolates Bach, and it's the kind of thing I love to do, so, uh, uh, you know, big fan of his. As far as uh, classical, uh, I love Bach. What do you like about Bach? Well, I mean, he was, again, uh, in a certain way, one of the first jazz improvisers. He, yeah, he was uh, a virtuoso, yeah. Yeah, he was a virtuoso, and, and he was a great improviser, uh, one reads. And um, I love the order and the uh, the intellect behind his music, uh, obviously the sort of polyphonic approach. I, I try to often, when I'm doing more free improvisations, to kind of extrapolate that sort of vibe and break into some kind of avant-garde, uh, uh, you know, pseudo-fugue, uh, which is sort of what Brad Meldo does also on this new album, which is why I like it so much. Um, but yeah, I, I love Bach. But then, I, again, I also love uh, Rachmaninoff and... Uh, his piano concerto number two. I, I was one of the first, one of the last real pieces. Do you have large hands? I could reach about a tenth and sometimes an eleventh. So I guess they're considered pretty large. Yeah, eleventh is crazy. <laughs> That's pretty. <laughs> what, what? It's not. It's not as useful. But reaching a tenth is very, very useful. Oh, what do you like about Beethoven? Oh, I just like his kind of seriousness and uh, intensity, and the kind of almost the combination of the classical uh, discipline of his writing with the sort of uh, proto-romantic elements of it, especially his later uh, stuff. Um, and I, it was just the kind of music that I was rooted in. It was one of the first sort of pieces, uh, styles that I that I played uh, with pieces like his Fur, Fur Lees and the Moonlight Sonata and, and pieces like that. Uh, and then going into his various uh, piano sonatas and some of his piano concertos. and uh, So it, it's just such a foundational music to my own um, studies, really, more, more than anything. You're a frequent collaborator with Questlove and The Roots. Uh, you worked with them yes. on their albums, and uh, you're good friends with them, right? I, I guess you could say. I mean, the funny thing is that uh, one of them, uh, Black Thought or Tariq Trotter, the, the rapper of the group, uh, lives apparently down the street from me uh, in the neighboring town of South Orange, which shares the same uh, school district as Maplewood, where I live. Uh, and yet uh, we've never really run into each other uh, over here. But, uh, you know, there are some things in, the, in, in, uh, in play right now that might lead to us uh, working more directly and, and even more locally in the near future, hopefully. What's it like working with Questlove and working on The Tonight Show? and that kind of thing it's really kind of um uh, incredibly exciting of course and especially given that uh i used to spend a lot of time touring and playing in front of audiences at festivals which was also very exciting but of late i've been more this domesticated dad guy who's you know writing more music in front of a computer most of the time so it kind of it, it's just a very exciting thing to just go out and uh, we did this for example uh, tribute to uh, john lennon uh anniversary birthday kind of concert um at Madison Square Garden and just went out and did this big concert in front of a roaring crowd. And I did some orchestral arrangements at Radio City Music Hall for them and that involved me also playing. So I was up on the stage with them for this Dave Chappelle night and, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, it's just incredibly exciting uh, to be part of that. And But I also just admire uh, what they've set up for themselves. Um, before uh, Questlove, I, I really started working with them through this manager and uh, and producer named Richard Nichols who passed away very sadly from cancer a few years ago. Uh, but he really helped put the roots together and uh, was almost kind of synergistically two sides of the, uh, of the same coin with, with Questlove. Um, 
so that was a very valuable and wonderful relationship uh, over several years. And and now I'm, I'm have uh, I have the pleasure of working more directly with with the Roots and you know going to their uh, on occasion when there's a project to their uh, essentially their recording studio that they've made out of their uh, dressing room backstage at the Tonight Show, which is where they record a lot of the stuff that they do both for the show, like the walk on music. They'll they'll work it out, uh, record it feed it into their headphones right before the guest comes on to remind them of what they worked out and then they play it, that kind of thing. But but also for outside projects, they'll go in and do a bunch of stuff. Um, so I, they just have a really wonderful system down and, and they're very, very open-minded, broad-based uh, artists, really. So it's, no, it's a pleasure to work with them. Didi, thank you so much for coming on the show. Did you have a good time? I had a great time. I, I love the show. I, I have to say, in the, the amount of uh, stuff that I've been exposed to listening to your podcasts, and uh, you ask wonderful questions. So uh, I did not I did not realize that by complimenting your uh, previous podcast, it would result in me doing it myself. But I'm very <laughs> flattered, that, flattered that you asked me. So I, so I thank you. Thanks so much for coming on the show. And I really hope you come back soon and have a wonderful rest of the day. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Thank you for listening to my interview with Dee Dee Jackson. What a great guest. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes. We're working hard on bringing more amazing guests like Dee Dee, and doing so would really help the show. Thank you again, and see you at the next show.